Did you try that gag I told you about? From the legendary dog-faced boy to the remarkable bearded lady, these performers left an impact on the world like no one else has since. As astounding and unique as their performances were, I was your man and I was just in my time. their lives were just as, if not more, fantastical. Come one, come all, to take a look at 20 circus freaks who had a very strange life. Daddy, take a bow. <laughs> <laughs> Myrtle Corbin From the moment Myrtle Corbin was born in 1868 in Lincoln County, Tennessee, it was clear she was special. Myrtle had four legs, an extra pair belonging to the twin sister attached to her body. The tiny legs moved but were too weak to walk on. At 13, Myrtle started performing in sideshows. Crowds marveled at her four limbs dangling beneath her dress. She socked and showed the extra legs to heighten the effect. Myrtle's cheerful disposition and showmanship earned her up to $450 a week, a small fortune then. Despite her popularity, Myrtle yearned for normalcy. She married Dr. James Clinton Bicknell, who insisted she leaves the sideshow circuit. Myrtle was thrilled to become a wife and mother. The couple settled in Texas and had eight children, half who sadly died young. After years of domestic bliss, the Bicknells hit hard times. In 1909, Myrtle returned to exhibiting, appearing at museums and circuses well into her 40s. She finally retired around 1915. In 1928, Myrtle developed a serious skin infection. Medicine then couldn't save her. She died at 59, leaving a strange legacy. In life and death, Myrtle's unusual anatomy fascinated and inspired. She proved that deformity needn't define a person. With four legs and two soles, Myrtle walked her own singular path. Now let's get ready for today's missing topic. She looked more like a modern art piece than part of a freak show, but the fabled lampshade girl was one of those performers that no one was able to figure out. She was born without a face and wore a veil around herself to cover up that she only had nostrils and a mouth. Not only that, but she had a small baby-sized protrusion coming out of her stomach that occasionally moved on its own. She toured around the states for 20 years until passing in 1922 from travel sickness. So now we want to hear from you. What are some other circus performers out there that the world needs to know more about? What anomalies have you seen out there in the world that should be put in a modern circus? How should a circus work in our time? Tap away on those screens, grab your keyboards, and don't forget to label your comment with hashtag missing topic. Robert L. Huddleston Robert Huddleston had an unusual start growing up on a farm in Missouri in the late 1800s. Born with a rare condition that caused his legs to bend backwards, he was unable to stand upright or use crutches. But Robert didn't let his disability hold him back. From a young age, he learned to get around on all fours, milking cows and doing chores just like any other farmhand. As a young man, Robert worked as a logging teamster, strapping himself into a wagon and hauling lumber for 15 miles a day. He toughened his hands by lashing small blocks of wood to them so he could traverse rocky roads without injury. Through this labor, Robert gained legendary arm and shoulder strength. During World War II, he found work as a blacksmith and carpenter, overcoming perceptions of limitation through determination and grit. After the war, struggling to find steady work, Robert turned to showcasing his extraordinary physique. Billed as the Pony Boy, he toured North America with carnivals, amazing crowds with displays of flexibility and power. It said he could even toss his right leg up over his shoulder like a bale of hay. For over 35 years, Robert traveled and performed, earning a good living and legions of fans. Chang and Ng Chang and Ng Bunker lived a life stranger than fiction. Born as conjoined twins in 1811, they were connected at the chest by a band of flesh and cartilage. As children, they learned to coordinate their movements, becoming adept at walking, swimming, and boating together. After being discovered by a British merchant in 1824, their fate took an extraordinary turn. Brought to America in 1829 as an exotic curiosity, they soon realized they could earn a living by putting their bodies on display. For years, the twins toured worldwide, performing acrobats and allowing doctors to examine their condition. Their fame led to the term Siamese twins, becoming synonymous with conjoined twins, Though initially treated like specimens, over time they gained more dignity and agency in controlling their acts. After becoming rich and retiring from touring in 1839, 
they became American citizens, settled in North Carolina, married local sisters, and had 21 children between them. Remarkably, Chang and Ng balanced their lives in two separate households, alternating between the home of each wife every three days. Though outsiders gawked, their communities accepted the twins as eccentric but contributing members of society. Even the chaos of the Civil War did not fracture the brothers' bond. In 1874, at the age of 63, Chang passed away due to a blood clot. Ang died just hours later, his life seemingly too entwined with his brothers to continue alone. Stefan Bibrowski Stefan Bibrowski's body was covered in a mane of golden locks from the time he was a babe. The hair grew thickest on his face, sprouting in a great bushy beard and flowing locks that made him look as if he wore a lion's pelt atop his head. His mother blamed the bizarre condition on witnessing Stefan's father mauled by a lion while she carried him in her womb. Ashamed of her abnormal son, she gave four-year-old Stefan to a circus to begin his career as a marvel. Lionel's great golden mane grew longer and thicker until it draped his body in a coat of fur. Audiences gasped and pointed when he walked on stage, but their shock turned to delight when Lionel flashed a grin and launched into daring acrobatic flips and tricks. Though shy off stage, under the big top, he was bold and charming, conversing with spectators to show his humanity beneath the fur. In 1901, the Barnum and Bailey Circus brought Lionel to America. For nearly 20 years, he traveled with the show, his figure inspiring awe wherever he went. Though billed as a freak, Lionel the lion-faced man had talents and dreams far beyond his bizarre appearance. He longed to be an ordinary man and aspired to become a dentist one day. But the spotlight always drew him back and his lion's mane made him truly one of a kind. Isaac W. Sprague Isaac Sprague was afflicted from a young age with a mysterious wasting disease that caused his weight to plummet dangerously. Though he tried apprenticing as a cobbler and working as a grocer, his frail body couldn't handle the demands of regular work. When a promoter spotted the emaciated young man at a local carnival, a new career path opened up. Isaac soon found himself on tour as the living skeleton, amazing crowds with his impossibly thin frame. When the legendary P.T. Barnum recruited him for his American Museum, Isaac became a star. Audiences were titillated and alarmed by the wispy man who looked like a stiff breeze could blow him away. For years, Isaac thrilled spectators across the country and overseas, sipping constantly from a flask of milk to maintain his strength. Though the crowds loved him, Isaac disliked circus life. After marrying his sweetheart Tamar Moore, the couple settled down and had three healthy sons, but recurring debts forced Isaac to rejoin Barnum's circus time and again. Despite endless medical exams, doctors never diagnosed the cause of Isaac's condition. The rare disorder wasted his muscles away, leaving him weighing only 40 pounds on a 5'6 frame. As he grew weaker, simply eating enough to stay alive became an ordeal. The strains of constant performing took their toll, and at just 45 years old, the iconic living skeleton succumbed to his mysterious illness. Though Isaac W. Sprague's own life was short and difficult, his legacy as one of the most memorable circus sideshow performers endured. Minnie Woolsey Minnie's early years were cloaked in mystery. Born with a rare condition in 1880s Georgia, she found herself confined to an asylum. Her days were undoubtedly bleak, but fate had other plans for Minnie. A showman caught wind of her unique look and spirited her away to the fantastical world of the circus sideshow. There, garbed in an American Indian costume, Minnie was reborn as Minnie Ha Ha. No longer hidden from the public eye, she now entertained eager crowds with animated dancing and chattering. The once forlorn girl had found her flock among fellow oddities and curiosities. Minnie's big break came when she landed a part in the iconic film Freaks. Though she had no lines, her scene-stealing performance as Cuckoo the Bird Girl left an indelible mark on audiences. Dressed in a feathery costume and strutting atop a table, Cuckoo shook and shimmied with carefree delight. Minnie clearly relished the attention, putting her heart into the captivating role. Years later, Minnie continued performing at Coney Island as the mysterious blind girl from Mars. By then, her dancing days were behind her. She often sat motionless for hours, giving blank stares to passerby. But her peculiar aura still drew the curious who wondered about the little woman once known as Cuckoo. Details of Minnie's twilight years and eventual passing remain a puzzle. 
Some say she danced into her 80s before being struck by a car in the 60s. Whatever the case, Minnie earned a peculiar place in sideshow history thanks to her memorable movie debut. Though dealt a difficult hand, she played her cards well, leaving behind an enduring legacy as Cuckoo the Unforgettable Bird Girl. Ella Harper Ella's knees bent backwards from the day she was born. The other children teased her as she shuffled down the dusty Tennessee roads, her legs curled under her body. But Ella didn't mind. She preferred scampering on all fours anyway, relishing the feeling of the warm earth beneath her palms. When she turned 12, the circus came to town. The ringmaster knew crowds would clamor to glimpse this girl who moved like a camel. Ella delighted in the roar of the audience as she frolicked across the big top. Night after night, she cartwheeled and hand-sprung to the spectators' cheers. Before long, Ella was the headliner at the Nickel Plate Circus, earning over $200 a week. Newspapers across America splashed the camel girl's picture on their front pages. Ella's fortune soared, but she longed to return home. After four years under the bright lights, the 16-year-old retired to her family's farm, pockets bursting with hard-won cash. In 1905, Ella met a kind school teacher named Robert. Though their marriage was short-lived, ending with his premature death, Ella found solace in motherhood, cherishing the laughter of her little ones. But sorrow clouded her joy when both babies died soon after in infancy. Ella's days turned lonely until a dark diagnosis arrived, colon cancer. But even as sickness wasted her body, Ella's spirit remained strong. She passed in 1921 at 51, leaving behind a legacy of resilience. Ella proved that no matter how unusual someone may seem, inside beats a heart longing for love. Joseph Merrick Joseph Merrick's life was one of both tragedy and triumph. Born with severe physical deformities in 1862 in Leicester, England, he faced cruelty and rejection from a young age. His own father beat him and kicked him out of the family home when he was just a teenager. Despite unimaginable hardship, Joseph maintained a gentle spirit. He found work as a novelty exhibit known as the Elephant Man in Victorian freak shows. Though the work spared him from the dangerous streets, he was treated as less than human by many who came to gawk at his appearance. When a young doctor named Frederick Trebs invited him to London Hospital for examination, it began a friendship that gave Joseph a new lease on life. Trebs and the staff ensured he had comfortable lodging and developed a rapport with the sweet-natured man behind the deformities. As Merrick's story spread, London High Society took interest and he found himself receiving many kindly visitors bearing gifts and friendship. For the first time, he experienced belonging and affection from those who saw beyond physical appearance to value his spirit. Joseph passed away at 27, but the four years of community he found gave him more richness than the prior decades combined. Though difficult roads lay behind and cut his life short, light shone into Joseph Merrick's world through those who chose to know his heart. Despite facing continuous rejection, he maintained a gentle soul to the very end. Grady Stiles Jr. Grady Stiles Jr. was afflicted with electrodactyly, a rare condition that fused his fingers and toes into claw-like extremities. He was folded into his father's sideshow act at the tender age of seven. Billed as Lobster Boy, Grady was paraded in front of gawking crowds, his deformity exploited for profit. As a young man, Grady fell in love and married a girl who worked for the carnival. Together they had two children, and when both were born with variations of their father's condition, they too became part of the family business. The Stiles family toured as the Lobster family and amazed audiences across the country. But behind the scenes, Grady had a dark side. A violent alcoholic, he frequently beat his wives and children, using his abnormal strength to overpower them. When his oldest daughter became engaged to a man he disapproved of, Grady picked up a shotgun and murdered the young groom in cold blood. Incredibly, the courtroom spectacle that followed allowed Grady to evade prison, the judge ruling that no institution could accommodate his disability. Feeling invincible, Grady's abuse of his family escalated. I killed before and got away with it, I can do it again, he would taunt them. Eventually, Grady's first wife, Maria, had enough. Conspiring with her son, they hired a hitman to put an end to Grady's tyranny. As he sat watching TV, oblivious to the fate about to befall him, the assassin entered and efficiently fired three bullets into Lobster Boy's head. Grady Stiles Jr., the murderous lobster man, was dead. Schlitzie Surtees 
The roar of the cheering crowd greeted Schlitzy as he danced onto the big top stage. Born with microcephaly, the condition left him small in stature and cognition, but his enthusiastic spirit brought delight to audiences. Billed as the last of the Aztecs, Schlitzy's sideshow drew gasps and applause across the country for decades. Though unable to care for himself fully and with limited speech, he could mimic those around him and react to conversations. His affectionate nature endeared him to fellow performers and handlers alike. In 1932, he captivated moviegoers in the controversial film Freaks. Alongside sideshow co-stars like conjoined twins Daisy and Violet Hilton, Schlitzy lit up the screen. Audiences were shocked by the horror scenes involving those with disabilities and deformities. The film bombed financially, banned for decades in some places, but later gained cult status. He continued performing after, cared for by various guardians. Chimp trainer George Surtees became his legal guardian for many years until passing in 1965. Schlitzy was institutionalized by Surtees' daughter, depressing him. Sword swallower Bill Unks recognized him at the hospital and brought him joyfully back to performing until retirement in 1968. In his final years, he entered Hollywood Passerby, feeding birds at his favorite park before passing at 70. Though his early life is a mystery, his decades of delighting fans proved that nothing could restrain his giant spirit. Charles Sherwood Stratton Charles was born a healthy baby in Bridgeport, Connecticut in 1838, but a faulty pituitary gland stunted his growth. By age four, he was only 25 inches tall and would not grow much more. In 1842, his parents took Charles to meet the great showman P.T. Barnum, who saw potential in the small yet handsome boy. Barnum taught Charles comedy routines and renamed him General Tom Thumb. He claimed Charles was 11 years old and from Europe to generate publicity. Curious crowds flocked to see the charming man in miniature impersonate Napoleon and other figures. Charles eventually toured Europe, even commanding performances for Queen Victoria and King Louis Philip. This brought Barnum fame and fortune. Back in America, Charles invested in a real estate in Bridgeport and built a miniature house, he met Lavinia Warren, a fellow little person performer, and fell in love. Their lavish New York wedding was the event of the year, attended by over 10,000 guests. The newlyweds toured the world for three years, performing in over 500 cities. By his early 40s, Charles had entertained more people than anyone else alive. The poor Bridgeport boy became rich and famous beyond imagination. Though disadvantaged in height, his talent and Barnum's showmanship allowed him to achieve remarkably. Many artifacts from his career remain at the Barnum Museum. Charles overcame his stature through charisma and determination. His story illustrates how one's weaknesses can become strengths with creativity and confidence. Despite his size, Charles left behind an enduring legacy much larger than himself. Josephine Clofulia Josephine Clofulia was born hairy in Switzerland in 1827. By age eight, she sported a beard two inches long. Her parents, not knowing what to make of their unusual daughter, sent her away to boarding school in Geneva. There, Josephine learned grace and charm, though her beard continued growing. By 16, it measured over six inches. Josephine decided to make the best of her situation and began exhibiting herself, traveling Europe with her father as her agent. Josephine gave birth to a daughter in 1851 and a hairy son, Albert, in 1852. Seeking fortune across the sea, in 1853, the family sailed to America to join P.T. Barnum's American Museum. Barnum billed Josephine as the bearded lady of Geneva and renamed baby Albert Infant Asau. Crowds gawked at mother and son, delighting in their strangeness. Then rumors swirled again that Josephine was no lady. The scandal erupted into a courtroom spectacle. Doctors thoroughly examined her, affirming once and for all that Josephine was indeed a woman. She continued touring America, her beard styled like Napoleon III's. The great ruler had gifted her a diamond for his imitation, charmed by her uniqueness. Josephine marveled people her whole life. Though her story ended sadly when she died penniless in an English workhouse in 1875 after falling ill, Still, Josephine lived more boldly than most women of her era. Josephine proved true beauty comes from within by winning over crowds with her grace, charm, and strength. Frances O'Connor 
Under the bright lights of the big top tent, Frances O'Connor captivated audiences night after night with her awe-inspiring talents. Born in 1914 without arms, she overcame her physical challenges to become a star entertainer with various traveling circus shows. Audiences were amazed at her effortlessly playing the violin with her feet, the toes deftly manipulating the bow and strings. She would loosen one string beforehand so it would dramatically snap during her performance, allowing her to showcase her dexterity by continuing to play unfazed. Frances was also a skilled marksman, able to accurately shoot the pips out of playing cards using a gun fired by her feet. Offstage, Frances sewed, wrote, and even smoked cigarettes using only her feet and toes. She worked for years with top circuses like Ringling Brothers, amazing crowds across the country. Frances also appeared in the classic film Freaks, where she demonstrated her unbelievable abilities. Though offered a chance at normal life, Frances chose to stay in the circus, pursuing her passion. Retiring from touring in her later years, she lived quietly in California. Her decades of performances were soon forgotten by y'all but devoted circus fans. She passed away in 1982 at 67, having spent her life overcoming adversity and bringing joy to others. Though born with physical differences, her extraordinary talents and perseverance in the face of challenges made Frances O'Connor a true star in the circus world. Prince Randian Prince Randian, though born without arms or legs due to a rare congenital disorder, overcame his disabilities in remarkable ways. Dressed in a skin-tight red and white woolen garment that made him resemble a caterpillar, he would writhe and wiggle across the stage. Audiences gasped and leaned forward in their seats as Randian used only his mouth to roll and light a cigarette. Holding the matchstick between his teeth, he would strike it alight, then carefully bring the cigarette to the flame. After lighting it, he'd inhale deeply and blow out smoke, astounding the crowd. Randian's act wasn't only cigarette tricks, he could paint by grasping a brush in his lips and maneuvering the canvas. He wrote by holding a pen the same way. Most incredibly, he even shaved himself using a razor attached to a wooden block, moving his face instead of the blade. Randian kept his performance props, including razors, brushes, and cigarette-making supplies locked neatly away in a box he claimed to have constructed himself. Discovered by P.T. Barnum in 1889, he performed in Coney Island with traveling circuses for over 40 years. In 1932, he appeared briefly in the cult classic film Freaks, demonstrating his cigarette feat. In December 1934, just hours after his final show at a New York museum, he passed away from a heart attack at age 63. Though short in stature, he stood tall as an inspiration, achieving autonomy and normalcy despite his disability through determination and ingenuity. Johnny Eck Johnny Eck was born a fraternal twin in Baltimore in 1911, but was different from most. He was born without legs. While his twin brother Robert grew normally, Johnny adapted to life without power limbs, learning to walk on his hands before his brother could even stand up. Though Johnny stood less than two feet tall, he never let his disability hold him back. By age 12, Johnny and Robert were performing together in sideshows across the country. Crowds were amazed by Johnny's acrobatic hand balancing acts and sleight of hand magic tricks. Though some gawked, Johnny kept a sunny disposition. In 1932, Johnny starred in the cult classic film Freaks. Though much of his part was cut, Johnny's memorable performance as the half boy left a lasting impression. He went on to act in several Tarzan films, playing a bird like creature. Off screen, the multi talented Johnny pursued many hobbies painting, music, racing model cars. He even climbed the Washington Monument on his hands. Later in life, Johnny and Robert returned home to Baltimore. Though their colorful neighborhood grew unsafe, the brothers continued to entertain visiting fans on their front porch. Johnny lived to age 79. Through all the ups and downs, he maintained his optimism, saying, if I want to see freaks, all I have to do is look out the window. To the end, Johnny Eck delighted in sharing his unusual life story and talents with others. Millie Christine McCoy Millie and Christine McCoy were conjoined twins born into slavery in 1851 on a farm in Whiteville, North Carolina. From just 10 months old, they were exhibited at freak shows and fairs, coined Freaks of Nature. Sold and resold, the twins were finally purchased by showman Joseph Pearson Smith when they were toddlers. Smith brought the twins and their mother, Monemia, to Britain, where the girls enchanted crowds nightly. 
Though conjoined at the spine, the twins tumbled playfully, sometimes walking on four legs, sometimes two. Despite the challenges of their condition, Millie and Christine were full of life and joy. They caught themselves eye and moved as one, their four legs in perfect rhythm as they danced. Their voices harmonized in song, with Christine singing soprano and Millie alto. The twins mastered five languages and toured the world. Wherever they went, the two-headed nightingale performed to sold-out audiences. Though billed as freaks throughout their youth and adulthood, Millie and Christine took control of their careers. The twins turned hardship to their advantage, pioneering clever dance moves and keyboard duets. Their memoirs at age 17 reveal their singular sense of self. After life on the road, the twins purchased their childhood farm and built a home there, but it burned down in 1909, destroying mementos from across the globe. The twins toured only sparingly after that, until tuberculosis took Millie, then Christine, in 1912. Though two separate people, the twins shared one extraordinary life. George Costantinus George Costantinus was known as the tattooed Greek prince, his body adorned with hundreds of exotic images from head to toe. Born in Albania in 1833, he grew up speaking numerous languages and living a life of adventure on the high seas. In his 30s, he joined a French expedition to Burma seeking gold, but the voyage met calamity when local authorities declared them hostile. Most of his companions were swiftly executed, but George and two others received an even stranger fate. They were subjected to an agonizing three-month tattooing ordeal, the Burmese crafting nearly 400 designs into Costinus's skin. He later claimed it took four men just to hold him down during the ruthless process. When finally set free, George embarked on an arduous journey home. Experts then scrutinized the intricate tattoos adorning his body, translating the Burmese text and discerning their traditional techniques. He began publicly exhibiting himself in Europe, wearing nothing but undergarments to display his extensive tattoos. When he came to America in 1875, the extravagant showman P.T. Barnum hired him for a circus at a lavish $100 per day. Billed as the illustrated man, he caused a sensation touring with Barnum across the states, but he met an ironic end. His sight failing just as fame reached its peak, retiring wealthy to Greece, his legend only grew when word spread the world's most tattooed man had gone blind. By 1894, he vanished, leaving behind an enduring air of mystery and marvel. Edward Mordrake In the 19th century lived a young English nobleman named Edward Mordrake, who was said to have been born with an unusual congenital condition. Though he had the graceful figure and handsome face, on the back of Mordrake's head was a second face, that of a demon. The eyes of the second face could move and its mouth could sneer, smile, or drool, though it could not see, eat, or speak. At night, when Mordrake tried to sleep, he claimed the face would whisper to him horrid things that only the damned would utter. He begged doctors to remove the demon face, but none would attempt the surgery. So he isolated himself, living in tortured anguish. The muted whispers from the parasitic twin were constant, slowly driving him mad. Though born to a noble family, he refused to accept his title, convinced that for some ancestral wickedness he was cursed to bear this fiend. Mordrake was said to be a profound scholar and gifted musician, but the devil twin clung to him, sleeping never, gibbering ceaselessly. The sightless face would smile as Mordrake wept, sneer when he was happy, and leer at spectators. At age 23, after a life lived in secrecy and solitude, Mordrake poisoned himself leaving a final request that the hellish face be destroyed before burial, lest it keep whispering even after death. Though little more than legend, Edward Mordrake remains one of medical history's most curious mysteries. Petrus Gonsalves Petrus Gonsalves was born with a rare condition called hypertrichosis that caused excessive bodily hair growth. He was initially believed to be a fabled wild man and kept in King Henry II's dungeon. After examination, royal doctors realized he was just an ordinary 10-year-old boy aside from his unusual appearance. King Henry educated Petrus as a nobleman, teaching him subjects like military tactics and Latin. As an adult, Petrus was married to a woman named Catherine, who was curious if more hairy children could be produced. Their first two children did not inherit his condition, but the next two did, as did some of their later children. In total, four out of seven of their children had the condition. P. 
Petrus and his hairy family members became celebrities as they toured European noble courts, their portraits were gifted and studied by the aristocracy. Though treated as nobles themselves, the family was seen as curiosities rather than fully human. The story of Petrus Gonsalves and his wife is thought by some scholars to have inspired the fairy tale Beauty and the Beast. Though the original folk tale predates them, Petrus' hairy appearance aligns with artistic depictions of the beast. His treatment by nobles also echoes the beast's backstory. While unconfirmed, Petrus and Catherine may have provided key inspiration for the classic love story. Fedor Jeffchu Under the big top, a hush fell over the crowd as the ringmaster introduced the next act. Fedor Jeffchu, the dog-faced boy from Russia. Murmurs rippled through the audience at the sight of the young man completely covered in long, shaggy hair. He looked more beast than human. Some recoiled in shock while others leaned forward in fascination. Fedor had been born with a rare condition called hypertrichosis that caused abnormal hair growth all over his body. He first toured Europe in 1873 with his equally hairy father, billed as a feral man captured in the woods. After his father died from drinking, 16-year-old Fedor was brought to America by P.T. Barnum in 1884. Playing up Fedor's dog-like appearance, Barnum spun a tale of the boy being tracked to a cave in Russia and captured by hunters. He described Fedor as a savage who barked and growled when upset. During shows, Fedor would snarl and snap much to the crowd's delight. In truth, he was fluent in several languages and loved interacting with audiences. For 20 years, Fedor toured with circuses globally. Crowds never tired of gaping at the curious canine-looking man. However, the grueling schedule eventually took its toll. While performing in Greece in 1904, he contracted pneumonia. Within days, the legendary dog-faced boy was no more. Mm-hmm. <laughs>